Welcome to Bible class. We're actually studying one of the uh, minor prophets of the Word of God, uh, that great, great preacher, Amos. A-M-O-S. If you'll remember, his name means burdened, as though he's carrying, and he is, a heavy load. And we have most recently been studying some of those burdens the Lord has placed on Amos where he must preach against the sin of the surrounding nation, surrounding Israel. And then he zeroes in on the iniquity of God's people themselves, of the Israelites. Tonight's text, Amos chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Get that class, verses 3 through 8. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Six verses of Scripture to claim our attention. I am not, deliberately, I am not going to hold the text in front of you for the duration of the class. Too many verses. I'm going to ask you to do this, uh, if you will. I want you to have your Bibles handy. It's not a bad idea anytime you're studying the Bible, uh, unless it is not possible in your particular circumstance. Um, but nonetheless, here is at least the appearance of the text. Amos chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Listen to me. It is another sermon. It is another oracle. Uh, that's a word that is somewhat synonymous with sermon. It is another declaration of judgment, but this time the focus remains on the people of Israel. Uh, you could almost say that verses 3 through 8 are a continuation of verses 1 and 2 that we studied in our last lesson. I'm going to hold up the text again. In that brief passage of Scripture, I, I'm going to call it a paragraph. Uh, it's got so uh, Bible scholars now call it a pericope. P-E-R-I-C-O-P-E. -E, a pericope. Uh, that means a paragraph that we have cut out, we have isolated and we will study only this, but we will set it in its before and after context. Look at those verses. They contain nine questions. Did you hear what I just said? They contain nine questions. Where are you going to find a passage of Scripture that contains nine questions, uh, sort of machine gun style, <laughs> sort of a staccato style. Nine questions God is asking to His people, Israel. Let's begin. In fact, due to the length of our text, we must begin. Verse number three. Here is the first question. Can two walk together except they be agreed. Can two walk together except they be agreed? This is, at least in my estimation, one of the better known, that's the way I'll put it, one of the better known verses in all of Amos. What a verse on fellowship, communion. Uh, what a verse that warns about separating yourselves from those with whom you do not agree. Can two walk together and uh, walk there? H-A-L-A-K, that's the Hebrew verb, walking day in and day out. This is continuous fellowship, uh, lest except they be agreed. They be agreed. And the word there for agreed, I'll spell it. Y-A-A-D, Ya'ad, and it means to assemble together. It means to meet 
hand in hand, face to face. Can two walk together except they be agreed? If, if we were in Hebrew class studying Amos, I would show you how the first five questions are introduced by a certain particle, how the next two questions are introduced by a second different type particle, and how the last two questions are introduced in yet a third. These questions are arranged in three groups, five, two, and two. Nine questions. This is the Holy Ghost at his best. He's always perfect at his best in authorship and in being the editor, the arranger of a pass of scripture. Now, let's answer the question. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Not for long. Not for long. But, but, but why this question? Why is God asking this? Wait a minute, preacher. You're saying God is asking this. I've got my Bible in my hand. Chapter 3, verse number 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken. And chapter 3, verses 3 through 8 are a continua that the Lord has spoken. The Lord is asking this question. Can two walk together except they... Be agreed. I think God is saying this. I am God, almighty, sinless, perfect, righteous. Amen, amen, amen. Israel, uh, you were my chosen people, still are. You're the apple of my eye. I've given you the beautiful treasures of the word of God, but you are not walking with me. We are not in the Greek. Can two walk together? There's a meeting. Can two walk together except they be assembled? except they be in agreement, except they are of the same mind and of the same accord. And the answer to this question, no, you can't walk with somebody if you're not agreed with them. And God is saying, Israel, I walked with you when we came out of Egypt. I walked with you across the parting of the waters at the, at the Red Sea. I walked with you through the wilderness I protected you, I fed you, I gave you a, but you've rebelled now. And uh, we are no longer going to be able to walk together. We are no longer agreed. It is a sermon in a single question. Quickly, class, I want us to go to verse four. Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Oh, what a question. Uh, they tell me, lion. did you know that the lion is the most often mentioned animal, predatory animal in the Old Testament? I would have thought maybe wolves. I, I would have thought about no, an eagle, lion. The lion is the most often mentioned predatory animal in the Old Testament. And, and uh, I'd say Amos knows something about lions. Remember, he's a shepherd. He's from the wild lands of Tekoa. Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Let me answer that. No. No. A lion sometimes will roar as he pounces on his prey to momentarily paralyze the little animal so he can't move. And always after he's killed his target, his victim, he will bring it back to his home, to his L-I-A-R, to his liar, and and, uh, and then he will munch. It, you can hear the bones crunching. He'll rip the flesh off, and, and then he, mm, mm, he'll roar then as well. Oh, my. Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? And if you'll recall, we learned back in Amos chapter 1, let me, let me open my Bible again. Amos chapter 1, verse number 2. I mean, we're just getting started. The, uh, the very motto of the book. And Amos said, The Lord will roar from Zion. The Lord will roar from Zion. 
How does question two link with question one? Question one, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Question two, will a lion roar unless he's taken prey? God is this lion. God says, I'm about to roar, Israel. I'm about to devour you. I'm about to attack you. And it's because you've not walked with me. You've sinned against me and rebelled against me. And I'm about to take you as my prey. P-R-E-Y. As my prey. Two questions. An ominous tone is developing. Verse 4 continues. Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? He's gone back to the lion's Dan, oh, that reminds you of Daniel, doesn't it? And uh, uh, maybe the mother, the lioness, has brought him some prey. Maybe he's a very fine. And, uh, and now he growls a little bit in satisfaction. That young lion is roaring in his den because he has taken something. That verb taken to seize, to snatch. And that's exactly what a lion does when he, when he goes hunting. <clears throat> Verse 5, we're going to leave the world of the lion and we're going to go to the, the, the world of little birds. Oh, how I believe Jesus loved the birds. He talked about the sparrow. He talked about, uh, 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 he was interested, frankly, in all of his creation. Uh, 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 um, verse 5, can a bird fall in a snare when there is no gin for him. This is a bird, and, and, and the Hebrew verb, I'm sorry, the Hebrew noun for uh, bird just means something that can fly, to fly. Uh, uh, can a bird fall into a snare? The bird uh, falls, he's coming down to the ground, he falls into a snare, a snare is a trap. Uh, it is a means of catching. Uh, they loved to eat birds so much, a whole profession uh, grew up around catching birds. They are called fowlers. F-O-W-L-E-R-S. The Bible mentions them. They, they have learned to devise. Uh, the bird comes in. The bird lands. Uh, in, in our English term, you've got a box. You've got bird seed under the box. You've got a, a, a stick holding the box up and you're hidden in a bush and you've got a string. You can pull the bird, gets under the box, eating the seed. You pull the string, the box falls and the bird is captured and, and, and uh, there, will be, there will be supper tonight. That's the idea. Can a bird fall in a snare on the earth where there is no trap for him? Mm. Listen to this. Shall one take up a snare from the earth? Will you open your trap? Will you lift your box and have taken nothing at all? More hunting terms. More terms from the country. Amos is a country preacher. Can two walk together unless they're in one mind and one accord? Israel, you've left me. You're not what you're not uh, agreed with me anymore. I'll roar like a lion. Israel, I'll be the fowler. I'm going to capture you. I'm going to capture you as a bird. You're, you're, going, to be, you're going to be in my net. They often would capture birds in nets. and, and uh, um, They would, uh, here comes a bird flying. And the fowler, just at the last minute, would pull a rope lift a net up in the flight path of the bird and the bird falls or, or a flock of birds uh, fly right into the net and the fowler drops the net and he has captured his birds. It's the idea of hunt and capture. God says, you're not walking with me. I'll be the lion to take you as prey. I'll be the fowler to catch you. And, uh, and uh, ominous, judgmental questions are being asked here. Look at verse 6, class. Look at verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city? The word there, uh, I want to glance and be sure, it's shofar, S-H-O-P-H-A-R. It's a ram's horn, a, a, an animal, a ram's horn. It's been hollowed out and, uh, and, and designed so you could blow through it and make a musical sound. Shall a trumpet, 
shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid. Now, in this context, in Amos' setting, that trumpet is announcing an approaching army. It is a trumpet of alarm. Two weeks ago, Debbie and I were in Illinois in a revival meeting. One morning, midday, there were some violent thunderstorms came through our area and a tornado was spotted near the motel. There was a a warning siren outside uh, the motel in that part of, uh, uh, of the little city in Illinois, and it began to moan. It began to, uh, the siren, siren began to sound, and uh, oh, it was an ominous sound. We knew danger was nearby. Danger could come across. And that's the same idea we've got here. Can a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? The people not be terrified. I can answer that question. No, if that warning trumpet sounds, the people will be afraid. Don't you see what God is saying through his prophet Amos? But God is the speaker. I'm going to bring an army against you. You keep sinning and rebelling against me. I will bring, and I'll go ahead and name the army. History verify the Assyrian army. It happened in 721 B.C. And they attacked the people of Israel. They decimated the Israelites. Uh, they, uh, they killed many of them, took the rest of them into slavery, carried them back to their uh, this foreign. Uh, can a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Listen to this one. Shall there be evil in a city? And the Lord hath not done it. Now, the word evil. It is based on the little noun, R-A, Ra. And it can mean evil in the sense of the worst possible sin. But now I'm going to make an announcement. We're going to deal with the verse. But I'm going to make an announcement. Someone better say amen. I, that's not a threat. I, I'm expecting to hear an Amen. God is not the author of sin. God is not the originator of sin. In fact, will I get an amen here? God cannot sin. I can show you scripture. God can't lie. God cannot sin. He's totally, perfectly righteous. Well then, preacher, what does Amos mean? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? Evil in this sense, and raw that noun does bear this meaning. And it's exactly the implication. Will there be disaster in a city? Evil. Will there be catastrophe in a city? Evil in that sense. Will there be, uh, will, will there be an earthquake? Will there be a famine? Will there be a tornado, a storm? Uh, will there, uh, and the Lord hath not done it. I can answer that. Proverbs says this. The curse causeless does not come. Amos agrees. If God sends disaster, if there comes evil, the Lord has done it. The Lord is the author. Am I talking to a class today that believes God is in supreme control of his universe? Am I talking to folks who believe he is the Alpha as well as the Omega? Does anybody believe he is the king of kings and the Lord of Lord? Anybody believe he's the Lord of the armies, the Lord of hosts, the Lord? Oh, yes, I'll answer that question. If there comes catastrophe, the Lord, the Lord has done it. And I think about along this time, this is a little bit of what I hope is my sanctified imagination. I think about along this time, somebody in this congregation, they're all Israelites. Amos is up north preaching. He is preaching to the sinners who are guilty of uh, uh, disobeying God, rebelling against God, and buying and selling one another, and, and, and worshiping gods other than an almighty God. And they say, wait a minute, wait, Amos, I think, we get you. I think we get your implication here. You're saying God's going to judge us. You're saying God's wrath is about to fall on us. 
You're saying we're no longer walking with God. We're not in agreement with God. And we want you to know we're Jews. We want you to know we're the stock of Abraham. That's what the Pharisees said to Jesus right before he said, I don't know you. Uh, uh, we, we, the temple is in our midst. And, and we got the Old Testament. Our men wrote the Old Testament under the direction of the Holy Ghost. They're beginning to uh, buck. They're beginning to rebel a little bit. Again, you're saying God's going to send disaster. You better watch it, buddy. We'll throw you in jail. We can end your life. We can make things miserable for you. Then comes verse 7. Then comes verse 7. You didn't pick it out when I showed it to you originally. I have taken verse 7 when I typed it out and glued it onto the poster board here. And I made it all caps, all capital letters. And I put it in red ink. Verse number 7. I want you to watch it with me. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. This is Amos' rebuttal. This is Amos' defense. They might be questioning what Amos is implying. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants the prophets. Mm. Two things I need to say about this verse. Well, really more than two things. Number one, the liberals, the modernists, the progressives, people that do not hold as high a regard of that book as we do, we believe it is perfect, inspired, infallible, without error. They say, Verse 7 is out of place here. They say that verses 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 are all questions. They are. And, and then they say in verse 8 is all questions. It is. And verse 7, it doesn't belong. Listen to Brother Bagwell. Listen to him carefully. I'll expect some amens. There's not one verse in my Bible that does not belong there. I will not allow anybody to take a verse out of my Bible and I will not let anybody add a verse to my Bible. Amen and amen. I believe it's perfect just like it stands. Purified of an almighty God. So we're not going to explain away verse 7. We're going to believe it and we're going to do our best to explain verse 7. Surely the Lord God surely the Lord God. The word there for Lord is Adonai or Adonai. What does it mean? It means the Lord who is my owner. Get this class. Adonai. Adonai can be pronounced or spelled either way. Uh, the Lord who is my boss. The Lord who is my possessor. The Lord who is my governor. The Lord who is my husband. The Lord who is my supreme commander. The Lord God. The Lord God, Israel's not walking with God. They're no longer in agreement with God. And God's about to jump on them like a lion on his prey. Uh, God's about to catch them like a bird is caught by a fowler. And, uh, and uh, he said, I just want you to know the Lord who is your governor, whether you're going by his will or not, the Lord God. And God there is Jehovah. You 6,000. 519 times in the Old Testament, God's predominant name. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. <laughs> he will do nothing. Asa, he will do nothing. The verb do, A-S-A-H, Asa. What does it mean? To do, to make, to fabricate, that means to build, to manufacture, God will not do one thing, but that God will not act in any way, but that he will reveal his secret to his prophets. He will reveal his secret and reveal Galah, G-A-L-A-H. Let me explain reveal. He'll unveil. Here it is in plain English. He'll make naked. He will not in any way hide his secret. And what is God's secret? The word is sowed. It's spelled S-O-D. Sowed. 
and it means his counsel, his will, his plan. Uh, 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 God will reveal his plan unto his servants. And that's the word for slave. I'm a willing slave. I'm a willing servant of an almighty unto his servants, the prophets. Nabi, Nabi, unto his servants, the prophets. And what does prophets mean? We've had it already. Somebody who speaks under the influence of another. I ought to be teaching and preaching. I believe I am here today uh, 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 in our evening meditation. Under the influence of another. Under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Under the influence of the precious Word of God. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm. I love that verse. I like to thank and class, you're in on it. Some of you spent hundreds of hours with me in these meditations. And the, I believe God will show us little nuggets. I believe He'll show us little secrets. I believe He'll show us things that Matthew Henry might have missed or, 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 or that some other great... Co God, the Holy Ghost, loves them to His servants, the prophets. But Israel, if you don't want to be His servant, if you don't want to walk with Him, He'll not reveal to you what He's going to... He's going to judge you instead of taking you into his classroom and making you one of his students. Verse 8, quickly. The lion hath roared. This is God again. The lion hath roared, and who will not fear? Oh boy, this thing's getting stronger. I believe these questions intensify as our paragraph develops. The lion hath roared. This is not now... This is not the lion might roar. The lion's going to roar. Perhaps The lion hath roared. God has delivered his message. Who will not fear? And honestly, I wonder if the Israelites feared God. I think they believe they're all right. I think they, they I'm doing pretty good. I'm a civilized man. I paid my taxes and, and, uh, and I do this. And, uh, 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 the lion hath roared. Who will not fear? Can I answer that this way? Anybody with common sense will fear if a lion roars. It ought to scare us. It ought to scare And God's the lion. And God, America, God's about to roar. But I don't see many people who are afraid. And then, watch, the Lord hath spoken. See the parallelism? The lion hath roared. The Lord hath spoken. Who can but prophesy? This is what Amos just said. Just like a lion roars and you can't help but fear if you're near him. God has spoken to me and I can't help but prophesy. Don't question my prophesying. Don't question I'm giving you the word. I cannot help but speak. I cannot help but prophesy what God has said. You know what that last verse is? It, it is a... Uh, Almost, they call it a call narrative. Amos is telling us how God called him to preach. He will do a, a, a more thorough job and a more detailed job uh, later on in the book. But right now, God spoke to me. God told me what to say, and I can't help it. I have no choice. I must, I must say thus, say it. The, the Lord has spoken who can but prophesy. And by the way, if God's really called you to preach, you know exactly what Jeremiah said. I was going to quit, but I can't. The Word of God was a fire burning in my bones, and I had, I had to speak out, and I had to preach. So I, I, I had no choice. Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. I have to preach what God told me to preach. Oh, that's burning in my heart today as well. Mm. Got to show you one more thing. This text... This, including this series of questions, started at chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord hath spoken. And look how it ends. In chapter 3, verse 8, God hath spoken. Dabar is the verb. Verse 1, God spoke. Verse 8, God spoke. And now, everything in between, it's not about Amos it's about God, and it's about God uh, dealing with His rebellious people, Israel. Listen to me. And the lion did roar, and the Jews went into captivity. The bird trap was sprung, and Israel was caught. God's wrath fell as He promised. Can I say something to America? 
Can I say something to the nations of the world? We're in rebellion against God. He has roared. Be sure your sins will find you. God, help us to repent. Help us to live clean, holy lives for your honor and your glory. Join us next class. We'll continue our study of Amos.